I want to thank our sponsors for this event. These events don't happen unless we have our sponsors help us out. And our corporate sponsors today are Rock and Trust Bank, our platinum sponsor, I'm sorry, our corporate, another corporate sponsor is Platinum Partners LLC, Land Use Permitting and Consulting. You can see Barry Crimmins and Maureen O'Toole. If you go to their table at any time during the day here, they are giving away a $50 gift certificate to the Pro Shop, Dirty Lee Pro Shop. Uh, so I don't know if you want to drop them drop off a card or yeah, just drop off your card over there at the uh, Platinum Partners table. We're going to begin the panels shortly, but before we start the panels, and I have to put my glasses on for this because I'm getting at that age. But uh, I, I, before I get to that, I also want to let everyone know that the, the New England Real Estate Journal, which has been around for oh, what, almost 60 years, we're going to be almost 60 years, and you'll see there's a, a, a journal on almost every table if you want to grab that and bring it home and go through it. But we put on 16 of these events throughout New England and New York, and we'd love to have some of the people that are here today join us at some of the other events. And that's the couple of words that I have to say. Oh, and one other thing. On the tables you'll find there's a business fraud flyer that the Brockton Trust has put out. If everyone could just take a look at that and maybe grab it and take it home with them, uh, I guess there's some business fraud that's going on. I don't know. I want to introduce uh, one of the important people today that uh, helped us put this together. Oh, well, I wanted to introduce you today. Yeah. I, I, I sort of lost the, uh, the, the sheet on your bio. Just make it up. Do you have that? That's fine. Well, anyways, it was a long bio. No one wants to hear it, Chris. Chris Cooney from the Metro South Chamber of Commerce as a partner that helped us put this all together and his crew. And I want to thank you, Chris, for helping us with this. And if you could, tell everyone a little bit about yourself, because I can't, I don't know that much. <laughs> thank you, Rick. Uh, on behalf of the Chamber, I want to thank you all for coming out today. I really want to thank uh, Rick Kaplan and the Real Estate Journal for partnering with us on this. As many of you know, they do this all over the state. Uh, and it came to our attention through Betsy Donahue at uh, Donahue uh, Real Estate that um, yeah, this might be the time to do it. And so when we approached uh, the New England Real Estate Journal, uh, which is located right down here in the Metro South region, uh, they were amenable, and uh, now that's why we're all here. So um, this is really a dynamic area. There are 300,000 uh, people in the Metro South region, uh, and 8,900 8, businesses uh, registered in this region. Now the region is pretty much from Randolph to Bridgewater, and Sharon to Norwell. So that whole area between 128, 95, Route 3, and uh, 495 down the south, uh, the Route 24 kind of going right through the middle of it. So that's how we define uh, the Metro South region. Uh, recent data shows that within 20 miles of uh, Boston, uh, Brockton has the lowest uh, real estate costs for residential, industrial, and commercial. Uh, it is primed for an upside, right? Uh, we have uh, great infrastructure and uh, wonderful transportation links. In fact, uh, recently 8,000 opportunity zones were approved in the United States through the, the uh, tax reform of last year. 8,000. Of those 8,000, we have eight in this region. Of those eight, uh, all of them are in the, the top percentage for upside. Uh, for return on investment if you invest in this region. In fact, we have one opportunity zone uh, in Brockton that is in the top 1%. Now, Brockton's not in a lot of top 1%, but in this case, uh, it's, it's, it's a great indicator that all of the pieces are in place and that an opportunity zone investment tax incentive uh, can really prove to be very valuable uh, compared to all of the other 3,000 uh, opportunity zones nationally. So, uh, two, two other quick things. We've got with us some new representatives uh, from the state uh, and the federal government. 
uh, that are here to assist. Uh, and you know, there are, you know, we talk about the seven-layer incentive uh, that, that happens in, in the state of Massachusetts, where you can access the start tax credits, and, and you're going to hear a lot about that today. Opportunity zone credits, transportation credits, all of that. There's actually seven different uh, buckets you can access. And so there's a, there's a few people here today I want to introduce you to. Uh, again, three of them are new. Uh, I'll first introduce George Durante from Mass Development. He is here and has been working uh, in Rockland for the last two years. And uh, I'm really getting a good idea of what's going on here. We also have two new folks from the Massachusetts Office of Business Development that have been assigned to this region. Uh, Margaret LaForest uh, is a former city council from uh, Quincy and is a new employee. Here, Margaret, give away. And we also have with us Sue Whitaker. Uh, with us, and she joins us from the Mass Hire System, uh, and just has been hired by the uh, Baker Administration again to help uh, businesses access these, these credits. So. We also have Susan Laurie, who's uh, here from the Small Business Administration and is assigned to this region uh, of the state. So, uh, again, there's uh, some federal uh, opportunity zones that uh, should be talked about. So, Susan, thanks for being here as well. And then last thing before I introduce our moderator, uh, we have with us uh, some very accomplished young men and women uh, from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Uh, they have a center for marketing research and they partner with us pretty regularly to do surveys. They're working today on an economic outlook survey for this region. If you would be so kind uh, to complete that survey, it's all anonymous, but the data can be very valuable going forward. Uh, many of you may be uh, familiar with the AIM survey. Some of the questions kind of go along those lines. So uh, it's only, I think, 12 questions. It shouldn't take you a few minutes. Uh, so I'm going to ask them to kind of spread out and, uh, and hand those out if they can and ask people to fill them out. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator today. Frank Clark uh, is, you know, a native son to Brooklyn, born and raised. Uh, he is now the president of the uh, Bridgewater State University. He also serves as chairman of the Metro South Chamber of Commerce and has for a year and will for the next year. Uh, BSU is located right here in the heart of Metro South. Uh, it has an enrollment of over 11,000 students. And uh, with their payroll and you know, infrastructure, their budget, it is a major economic uh, uh, factor and force in our region. And uh, we're delighted that he has uh, agreed to moderate today, but also become involved in the community to the level he has, because uh, we know education uh, is a key driver of economic growth. And uh, so please join me in welcoming Fred Clark. <laughs> Uh, Chris, I found your, uh, your bio. <laughs> it's five pages long, that's why I didn't read it. Yeah. All right, we just ran out of time. We just ran out of time, sorry, we can't introduce Chris. <laughs> um, I want to thank the, uh, the journal, uh, Rick Kaplan and Chris Cooney, for bringing us all together. I want to, in advance, thank our panelists and all of you for joining us. We have a few slides up on the on the board up there on the screen for you to take a look at. And I think uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you to take a look at those slides. But in setting the context, which Chris just said, um, we know that this region is, is very heavily dependent upon people driving all by themselves to work. They're going in all kinds of different directions, particularly north into Boston. And that number of drivers presents an opportunity for mixed use development to allow people to work more locally. And it also presents an opportunity for additional housing development near or abutting commuter rail or other transportation nodes as well. The region, this region is getting older, um, as many of us know as well. And there are, at this point, not enough spots for young families, multi-use, multi-family development. Uh, there's not enough of that development to attract younger workers, so there's opportunity there as well. And, Directly connected to the aging, uh, the aging workforce is the fact that school enrollment is declining as well. And as a matter of fact, school enrollment is going to decline by about 10%. We're already in the, in the middle of it right now. That's going to present difficulties for employers as well. But because of uh, the proximity of Brockton, Metro Brockton, there are opportunities to build housing to, to attract and support more younger families as well. And if you read any of the, the more recent studies about uh, gridlock in Boston or housing costs in, Brock, in, in Boston, rather, um, you see that um, 
there are great opportunities only 30 miles south of Boston for Brockton to emerge. So opportunity is the word. And we have a really terrific panel uh, to help us talk through uh, that opportunity and maybe in an innovative approach to a, a, a addressing that opportunity. So let me bring up our panel. We have a, um, a really all-star panel, the first panel and the second panel as well. And Clark Ziegler is here, the executive director of the Mass, Mass Housing Partnership. Come on up, Clark. We have Tyler McGrail, Senior Managing Director of Newark Knight, uh, Newmark Knight Frank, Mark Donahue from Donahue uh, Associates, and Jason Cord from Capstone Communities. Come on up, gentlemen. I did a very quick introduction there, but we're going to go right down the line and have uh, each of our panelists just say a few words about themselves, about their uh, organizations, and Maybe just a word or two about what you're currently focused on, starting with Clark. Sure, thanks. Um, it's great to be here, and particularly thanks to the uh, Chamber for co-sponsoring this event. Um, I'm the director of the Massachusetts Housing Partnership. We're a quasi-public agency and asset state agency in Massachusetts, and we finance multifamily housing. We work with banks to provide mortgages for first-time home buyers. Um, we've financed about 26,000 rental units. Uh, we've financed about 21,000 first time home purchases, including many, uh, both in this region. Um, we also work with communities to uh, encourage production of housing for, at all income levels, and most recently created a center for housing data to help focus attention on how the housing market in the Commonwealth and uh, some of the other needs that we're trying to address. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks, Fred. Um, Tyler McGrail, just working. Just took Sorry about that. I'm Tyler McGrail, I'm the Senior Managing Director at Newmark Knight Frank. Uh, my primary focus is on the 128 self office market, leasing market, so uh, with my team in the last five years, we've done over two and a half million square feet of office leasing here in the South Shore of Massachusetts, and um, we have a lot of projects going on right now that we'll be happy to talk to you about right in this area, but hopefully today I can share with you some of the things that we've seen succeed and, and what's going on throughout Boston and the suburbs because those two markets are talking to one another more than ever. As we really are saying that the world has become flat to an extent where um, what's going on in Boston relates directly to what's going on here in the suburbs. So happy to share some of that insight with you today. Thank you, Sarah. Marco. Good morning. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Mark Donahue. I'd like to thank the Chamber of Commerce, first of all, Chris Cooney for organizing this. The New England Real Estate Journal. Um, a very special place in my heart for the New England Real Estate Journal. <clears throat> when I started my business over 30 years ago um, and had no experience in commercial real estate, the first thing I did was buy a subscription to the New England Real Estate Journal in Banker and Tradesman and uh, would read those issues from cover to cover and, and learn the market. And, uh, it was a business that was started from the ground up with no, no prior experience, but I had support from uh, the Greater Brockton community and uh, Chamber of Commerce was also very instrumental in helping us build our business. Uh, we're now seven brokers strong, 32 years in business. Our primary focus is on selling and leasing industrial properties, office properties, and development sites in the area south of Boston. Our geographic area is growing as the years go by. We're now doing more deals in Metro South and looking forward to growing the business. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Jason? Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Jason Corb. I'm the principal of Capstone Communities. Uh, this event, actually, the timing of this event is a little strange. I was thinking about this. So, I think exactly 10 years ago, today, plus or minus a few days, I walked into Mary Waldron's office. Having just started my own company, I had seen an ad for a building on the internet for Mark <laughs> uh, in downtown Brockton, which is the old Stall and D building, which we, we ended up turning into Station Lofts. Um, and so uh, my company focuses on mixed income housing. And I had just launched my company 10 years ago. and saw Brockton as a really great opportunity. Um, since then, we developed station lofts as well as another, uh, a number of other developments, both mixed income, historic rehab, um, as well as market rate housing. 
So this is a little bit of like a reunion for me coming back here today and seeing everybody. I think I know like half the faces in the audience. So Brockton's a very special place for me, personally. Thank you, Jason. You were very smart to start your conversation with Mary Walter. <laughs> it's always a good place to start. I, I want to uh, begin with Clark Ziegler, and not because you have a tremendous first name uh, matching my last name, but uh, you have a, a, a great overview I think of uh, the real estate market because of your perch at the uh, Mass Housing Partnership. So I, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about what you're seeing in terms of demand for housing. Sure. Um, from our perspective, we see huge unmet demand for housing in this region. We finance a little over a thousand units of new housing construction in the Metro South Chamber region. Uh, we have several hundred additional units pending in the development process now. And the market has been incredibly strong. Um, a great example is uh, development in mixed income development in Bridgewater uh, um, by the Claremont companies that uh, leased up well ahead of schedule. Rents are much market rents are much stronger than originally projected as a lender. I love that. Um, and this, the backstory, which won't be a surprise to most of you, is we have a chronic undersupply of housing in Massachusetts that you. I heard the governor out and about talking about this issue. We are built, we are permitting and building substantially less housing than we did in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And as a result, we have a huge shortage, uh, a huge gap. Today, somewhere around 40,000 units um, uh, that the market's not supplying that are needed. That's putting pressure on rents, on home prices. It's making it harder for young people to settle in Boston or Greater Boston and find jobs. I think that the the challenging part of this conversation, and the interesting part of this conversation, is to think about this region not as an outer ring to the Boston-Cambridge inner core market, but as its own economy. Um, I think there, we can, we can get into some of the details in the discussion, but, but um, you are feeling the brunt of the lack of housing supply close in to Boston, but there are a lot of opportunities here to create, and, and uh, Fred mentioned this in his, in his introduction, to create mixed income opportunities, a more urban living to, to attract younger people to fill new jobs in this region. I think that potential is huge and it's, and it's, a, it's a conversation that really ought to happen. Thank you, Clark. So demand is strong. Uh, Tyler, so we were just talking about housing demand. What about demand for office space? And, and that demand is helping to shape um, des designs uh, from your perspective for that, uh, that housing or commercial property. Can you speak to that? Sure, of course. And, and I think it all ties back from our perspective to some extent in the office market. It all relates back to Boston and Cambridge and what's going on there right now. And just to give you a sense, uh, Boston vacancy right now is 6% and Class A rents in Boston are approaching $80 a square foot on an average basis. And it's just, it's insane. You've had 5 million square feet of new tenants come into Boston out of thin air in the last four years, and that's everything from Amazon to the Alexions of the world have gone into the seaport. And what we've seen is that Cambridge and Kendall Square is driving an incredible life sciences growth. So 95% of the demand in Cambridge right now is from life sciences and tech, and you have 0% vacancy in Kendall Square, which is just, it's, it's as hard of a market as we've ever seen for a tenant in Boston in Cambridge, and what we think at, at Newmark is that that creates an incredible opportunity for people to develop office space in the suburbs and to really create an outlet for tenants who are either priced out of Boston, can't grow within Boston, and we've seen anecdotes where this has worked in the last five to six years. We've worked on a million and a half square feet of repos office repositioning projects from Quincy all the way down to Stoughton that have been incredible successes. And we think that we're in the really early innings because what we're now hearing is the millennial workforce is getting older. Um, for a period of time, everyone wanted to be in Boston, and Boston was Oz to everyone as we saw it to some extent. And now what we're hearing is, you know, people are starting, people, millennials, which I'm one of, are starting to have children. They want to have more space, and companies can't grow in Boston. And I think ultimately. What really is driving it now is there's been a, a, a fundamental shift in how office tenants are making decisions. It's no longer a cost center. It used to be, where can I find the cheapest cost option for real estate? Um, how can I drive the bottom line? Where can I find functional office space? 
And a lot of those decisions are now being made by HR and other people and the CEO within the organization to say, we need to use our office space and real estate as a tool and as an asset to recruit and retain employees because it's no secret that we have extremely low unemployment and there's really a war for talent right now to hire well-educated uh, young workforce. And, and so what we've seen is numerous developers, and it just happened in Stoughton with the old Reebok facility, um, the Campanelli acquired in 2016, numerous developers have come in and created these live, work, play environments where you have housing, you have amenities, and you de de uh, develop it all for the tenants, put it all in the building, and we've seen tenants come from Boston, from well, uh, markets like Newton, Needham, and Wellesley, and say, hey, this works, we like the ability to grow here, and it's at a great price point, and I, I think it's uh, safe to say we're in the really early innings of that, and there's immense opportunity to uh, do that here throughout the metro itself, and to create those sorts of environments that will attract tenants. Great, thank you, Tyler. And but we're going to keep going down the panel. But I would, if you do want to jump in on someone else's answer, just give me a, a pointer, pointed finger, or something, and we'll call on you. But Mark, you've been around a long time. You've uh, seen the real estate market, and my comment here was to ask you what the market was 100 years ago. But I think that's a typo. <laughs> um, what, what have you seen over the past 10 years in terms of trends and demand in this particular region, and um, how is it different based on what you've already heard? from our other two panelists. What, what are you seeing out there now compared to 10 years ago? Well, uh, I tell you, you know, when you have a, a career that spans 30 or 40 years, maybe 50, <laughs> um, you have the great value of having hindsight and having lived through some real estate cycles. There's no question, uh, as Tyler points out, that this is the strongest market I've ever seen in 30 years. Demand is through the roof. And uh, back, uh, I guess one of the seminal moments in my career in real estate was when the market crashed in 2008, 2009. And uh, as a relatively small commercial real estate firm, uh, does a lot of sales and a lot of leasing, we have what's called an escrow book. And an escrow book is where you put your deposits on pending sales. And typically, you know, we may have 10 or 20 uh, deposit checks in escrow for pending sales. And in 2009, I opened my escrow book and it was zero balance in the escrow account. So the whole market froze in 2009 in terms of the real estate market in south of Boston. It was complete paralysis. People didn't know what to do. A lot of people, myself included, lost 30 to 40% of our net worth. And uh, I looked around and I said, you know what? It doesn't matter because Tyler McGrail's portfolio is down 40%, Jason's portfolio is down 40%, and my portfolio is down 40%. And uh, you learn to stay the course, stay in the market, uh, continue to work hard and do what you can with the circumstances at hand. Thank you, Mark. I think we've heard from our first three panelists um, opportunity because of the demand that we're seeing at an unprecedented level, the highest in 30 years. Jason, you've taken advantage of that opportunity. Um, you've put that demand into action. What are the attributes you see in your role and your efforts here in Metro South in the, the Brockton area? What are the attributes of this area that you see as a, an opportunity? Um, so, when I came down to Brockton in 2009, I, I said to myself, I think I was one of the first to do something in downtown Brockton. Uh, Jim <coughs> Keith from Trinity was formulating a really large scheme that um, really large plan of developing an entire block, which has happened very successfully. Um, and Brophy Phillips was doing something. But besides that, not a lot of people were doing much. Um, what I've noticed over the last 10 years, too, is that there, the level of energy has increased and increased and increased. And, now, there's a lot of excitement and energy around downtown Brockton. When I came into downtown Brockton, it was, I would say it was kind of relatively sleepy. Um, and I always saw a lot of opportunity. There's historic mill buildings, one of which I redeveloped. The fact that the train went into South Station, I thought was a huge asset. Um, now, North Station is starting to compete with Hub on Causeway, um, Avalon, uh, 
Well, it worked. There's tons of projects going on in North Station, but at the time, it was everybody wanted to go into South Station. And that's where all the jobs were. Um, Brockton has great school system. Uh, I remember there was a New York Times article that came out um, that said, you know, we went through the history of, of Brockton High and all the different um, programs that they offered. So, uh, located, you know, next to 24, located next to the train, having a great infrastructure in the downtown. Um, not to state the obvious, but we go into a lot of places and there's no public water, no public sewer. Uh, the electric infrastructure is, you know, falling apart. Brockton and in, in the Metro South region in general has all of that. We're doing a project in Bridgewater right now. We don't need water, we don't need sewer, it's all public, it's all available, there's capacity there. Um, there are also places like Dorney Lee, where we're sitting right now. Um, Brockton has two amazing golf courses. Um, so it's a place where, you know, it offers families a lot, it offers workers a lot. Um, and we felt like when we developed Station Lots, we were pricing out our two beds, two baths, in-unit laundry at thirteen fifty a month. Um, and you compare that to, you know, the South End or the Back Bay, at the time when rents were in the three thousands, now they're in the four or five thousands. And we thought that you know a lot of people would want to live here, and it was proven to be correct. So, Jason, thank you very much. Yeah. Clark, I'm going to come back to you. Um, housing and economic growth are linked, <clears throat> and if you don't have enough housing, you will have stalled economic development. Um, what concerns do you have um, as to the lack of housing production, and maybe the lack of? housing production for families that we had talked about uh, a little bit earlier. What concerns do you have for economic growth in this region if we don't move on housing? Sure. sure. So the, the, um, the challenge now, as I mentioned previously, the, the, the chronic housing supply gap, then there's a huge demographic wave coming our way. We have about a million baby boomers who are expected to leave the workforce by 2030 most of whom are probably not going to leave Massachusetts. They're going to live somewhere. They'll live to stay in their single family home uh, as empty nesters, or they'll downsize a bit, but that most of those folks will stay here. We're not building housing for, for new, younger workers to fill those <coughs> existing jobs, let alone grow jobs. Um, we have this demographic wave coming our way, and we have um, a zoning and land use uh, system in Massachusetts that, to be very polite, is parochial and very local and very difficult. And I think the net, there are a couple ways the net effects of that. One is at the community level, there are a lot of towns um, in this region that are aging very rapidly and the percentage of young families with children is declining a lot relative to where it was historically. And it's kind of a values question from a community perspective. Is that really you know, the community that you want to be? But from an economic development perspective, um, and Tyler was, was spot on saying, you know, businesses locate where the town is. They don't, you know, the idea that you just pick, pick a spot in the town will always come to you is out the window nationally as a, as a business strategy. And the, the opportunity to attract work and keep workers in the region, I think it's great. Um, you know, the idea of tapping into the Boston market and commuter rail um, is a great, is, is one great strategy. And, and uh, I just pulled the numbers up. Commuter rail ridership to 14 commuter rail stops uh, in, in the Metro South region, less than 9,000 daily riders. It is an incredibly underutilized resource. The service could be better the, if regional rail, uh, if we have more frequent service in both directions. Uh, commuter rail could be a way to bring workers to this region rather than export those workers to Boston and Cambridge. So there's a lot of potential here, but I think we really need to be having that conversation. And I think as a region, uh, you know, uh, folks who are local here need to have a conversation about do we want to be an outer ring of Metro Boston or do we want to be our own local economy uh, with our own talent pool um, and with you know people not sitting in their cars all day going to work. Thank you, Clark. <clears throat> Tyler, we um, with all of that opportunity, you have to innovate um, with the constraints that um, are out there. We're going to talk about the challenges of constraints. Can you give us some examples of uh, commercial? property repositioning that uh, you've been involved with or seen that um, are in that space of innovation moving to meet demand and seize opportunity. Absolutely. So we've had the pleasure and opportunity to work on a, a number of uh, significant repositioning projects. And so what's happened here in the South Shore market from our perspective is there have been, historically this has been a, a back office market, right? So you've had 
tenants like State Street and Blue Cross, who've had big presences in places like Quincy and Reebok, the old building down in Stoughton, that when they left, those buildings sat vacant for a good period of time. And a lot, for a long period of time, uh, developers and investors were very scared of them. They, they didn't necessarily want to go in and invest in those buildings. They thought that they might only be conducive to single tenants, and, and they thought that that might be a long haul to re-tenant the buildings and ultimately create the value that they need to make it worth their while. And what's happened in the last decade is that, and it really all started in North Quincy, um, State Street gave up half a million square feet in North Quincy in 2010-2011 time frame. Everybody thought that market was was done, was for dead. It was 30% vacant. People couldn't fathom where that next tenant base came from. And we've had the pleasure of working with Campanelli, who's a who's a, a long history developer here in the South Shore. And they went in and bought those buildings empty. And they went in and invested close to 10 million dollars in the base building. So adding everything from fitness, cafeteria, grab-and-go cafe, uh, brand new lobbies, um, all sorts of innovative concepts to the point that we actually went with them into Boston and looked at all of the amenities that people were offering in Boston and studied the cafeteria, the fitness, the breakout areas, the coffee bars, and said, let's bring this to North Quincy. And our whole thesis there was we're on the red line, we're four stops out of Boston, 20 minutes from South Station, and rents in Boston at the time were $50 a square foot. And we could invest all of that money into those buildings, create all of those amenities, and offer $25 rents. And so what we did was we went into Boston, into the seaport, into the back bay, into the cell station, and targeted all those tenants who were paying $20 to $30 a square foot. Their lease came up for renewal, and they got a $60 renewal proposal from their landlord. And we said, hey, look at all this, this um, great stuff we've created in North Quincy. It's live, work, play. You can recruit the people you want. You can get people to come out to you. There's a great workforce that lives around it. And we were able to lease 450,000 square feet there in four years. And I think that that was the first project in this cycle that really changed the game from my perspective. Because we took that game plan and we brought it down to Stoughton, to the old Reebok facility that Reebok built to be their world headquarters in 1988. And that it sat vacant for a period of time with a landlord who wanted one tenant wanted to wait for that big fish to come along. Campanelli bought the building, spent another $6 million on spec with no tenant to add all of the amenities. We have everything from a fitness center, coffee bar, uh, innovative food service, grab-and-go cafe, a uh, beautiful lobby with a spiral staircase, patio with fire pit. We created all of those amenities right in the building. And I think everyone in the market at the time said, will this succeed? You're going further out from Boston will this succeed? And we've leased over 150,000 square feet there in the last two years. And I think it's been an incredible success. And a lot of those tenants are just what I was speaking about, tenants who were closer to Boston per se, but said, we can't grow here. We, we don't feel like we have the work environment that we need. And we want to be in a building that's energized and feels vibrant. And, um, and we had an incredible success luring those tenants down to the building because we, they delivered those amenities on spec and you didn't have to go in and imagine it, and there was no question if it was going to happen. So I think that that formula has been refined, and we're working on a new project in Canton with Campanelli at 250 Royal Street, the old uh, computer share building that we actually just did our first lease in. And I think that that formula of delivering amenities on spec, it, it, it has proven concept, and uh, for a period of time, developers weren't necessarily thrilled with the idea, but I think we've shown that if you, if you deliver it, they will, you know, the tenants will come. Tyler, you're moving in the right direction, Quincy to Stoughton. Let's keep going south. <laughs> so do you, um, do you have a sense that that formula is applicable here based on what you're what you Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, with what happened in Stoughton, there's, there's no question in my mind that there's a strong office market. And um, again, it just all comes back to creating that environment. That the CEO, the HR team, they all walk into and say, we can hire here. When we have to interview and somebody goes and interviews with five different companies, we want to have space that they don't have a place that they'd really be excited about working. And again, it all goes back to leveraging your real estate as an asset. Mark, I'm gonna hold on you just for a second because I wanna to go to Jason. By the way, Jason mentioned Brockton had two courses, golf courses, there's actually four. I didn't know that because I'm barred. Uh, unless they have shadowproof windows, I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, but it's actually four, uh, to call it too private. But Jason, you, you know, innovation is your middle name. You know, and you've done a lot of great work. 
in downtown Brockton, <clears throat> and you've you've really addressed uh, uh, issues, housing issues, um, through historic by repurposing historic buildings. So that repositioning, uh, in this case, repurposing, uh, is something you have had a lot of experience with. Can you talk to talk to the uh, audience here about <clears throat> repurposing historic buildings, and what are the challenges and opportunities there? Sure. Um, Historic is definitely my passion. I was the vice chair of preservation in Massachusetts, and I was a history major in college, so it was kind of a natural fit for me. Um, prior to starting my own company, I worked on the shovel works um, in Easton, the Ian Shovel Works was my project, uh, in downtown Sharon, the Wilbur School as well. So I was very, when I started my company, I was very familiar with historic preservation um, in, on the South Shore. Uh, so we had someone, one of our tenants, one of our first tenants to move into Station Lofts, walked into her unit and said, oh my god, I feel like I'm on HGTV. Um, <laughs> and so... <laughs> this is after. <laughs> we can talk about before in a minute. Um, but there's a... Uh, uh, we're not building these buildings anymore. No one's building four or five story mill buildings with two foot thick brick walls. Um, 10 foot ceilings with exposed beams and columns and gorgeous floors. And we, we really try to take advantage of that. So um, we try to restore as much as possible in the building. That's, there's two reasons for that. Um, the first is that we think people really like it. People like, you know, 10 foot ceilings. They like to feel like they're living in an old mill. They like to feel the history. They like to see the floors that are, you know, some of the floors were damaged. And our architect said, do you want to keep them or do you want to save them? And we're like, we're going to save them, definitely. Um, the fourth floor of the building actually was used as a bowling alley, a portion, no, an unofficial bowling alley. <laughs> um, so, you know, it has these huge windows because they needed a lot of fenestration back then to bring in natural ventilation, right? Um, and that all translates to, to great residential, a great residential look and feel. And then to support all of that financially, um, the government has uh, federal and state historic tax credits, which I'm sure many of you have heard about now. So as long as your building qualifies to be on the National Register of Historic Places, and most historic buildings or older buildings in downtowns do, you can leverage this resource along with other resources um, to create additional equity to support both the redevelopment of your project overall, as well as to fund some of these historic features like we're not going to put plain final windows into these buildings. We're going to replicate what was originally there. Um, so that's exciting. On the challenges side, um, I'll tell you a quick story about when we were doing station lofts. So uh, we had an existing sprinkler system in place, and there was a safe, a really interesting safe. It was on the second floor of the building, and it was really heavy. So our contractor decided to cut a hole in the floor and push it through the floor. Um, well, there's this existing sprinkler system had glycol, <laughs> and so the safe goes through the floor, hits the sprinkler system, <laughs> sprinkler system explodes, the glycol goes all over the, the soil, <laughs> um, which, is, it, which results in what's called an immediate response action from the DEP standpoint. So we report it to the DEP, we have to then categorize the soil. Now we had done, if you look at the, the site isn't that large, and we probably put 75 borings in the site before construction, okay? So we, we thought we knew everything that was in the soil. So we pre-characterize the soil, and we find PCBs in the soil. Now, from the, in the scheme of environmental issues, you have things like metals, which aren't that serious, and on the complete opposite end, you have PCBs. <laughs> um, it's so significant that the DEP, the state DEP, doesn't regulate PCBs. The federal EPA <laughs> regulates PCBs. Um, so we had to work through the federal government. We had to get this plan approved. Um, it took months and months, and we couldn't just stop construction. <laughs> so we continued building out 90% of the building. In this, the southern end of the building, we left completely open. <laughs> so we had like units on the first floor that had drywall, and then we had a section on the southern portion that was still open. This all occurred when, if you remember in 2013, who remembers what happened in the middle of 2013? The government shut down. <laughs> so the EPA is obviously part of the federal government. <laughs> so we literally got our plan approved by the EPA like a week before the government shut down. <laughs> 
So my point is that these historic buildings all have these interesting challenges. I'd say environmental is at the top. Um, a lot of times you get into a historic building from a structural standpoint. You open up things. You thought you opened up enough walls, and you open up one wall that you didn't open up, and you know you see rot. You see you say to yourself, oh my god, why did they do this? <laughs> but and then you have to deal with it. So having the right contingency in place, having at least a 10% contingency instead of a 5% contingency makes all the difference in the world. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we're never going to be building these types of buildings again. And, and I know a lot of buildings in downtown Brockton have been demolished, um, uh, back in urban renewal. Um, but saving the remaining buildings that we can, I think, is exceptionally important. And we're doing a project in Bridgewater, the McElwain School, which will also be um, a historic rehab. Um, and just a quick anecdote there, uh, at one of our zoning hearings, the former principal's wife came to the zoning hearing and spoke. Um, and she's on a fixed income. This is going to be a mixed income development. And she remarked about how wonderful, and her husband had passed away, how wonderful it would be for her as someone who wanted to stay in Bridgewater on a fixed income to be able to live in the building where her husband was the principal. And you can't do that in a new building, right? So it really touches your heart and you know, exudes a lot of memories for people. So That's great, thank you. Um, people didn't know what happened with the government shutdown because it used to be an aberration. <laughs> now it's hard to keep track of them all. <laughs> yeah, true. Um, the, um, you know, the, that issue of challenges um, is where I think I want to uh, you know, and but I, but before we do, I want to go back to Mark, because we're talking about opportunities, demand, and how the demand is helping to shape the stock, commercial or residential. And you, you spoke to it beautifully, I think, Jason. But Mark, what are you seeing in terms of what's actually out there? What are people building? What are people offering? Um, well, the uh, part of the uh, story that I have follows what Tyler has to say. Um, as Boston explodes, uh, gentrification takes place. You put University Avenue, uh, developers came in, they bought up all of the industrial buildings that were on University Avenue. All those companies were displaced, so they had to leave Westwood and Canton, and they had to seek warehouses and manufacturing facilities outside that area. So the natural progression is for them to go down to places like Stoughton, Brockton and Bridgewater. There's been um, tremendous gentrification in the last 30 years. Uh, the demand for uh, industrial land is through the roof. Uh, the prices for industrial properties have skyrocketed in the last six years, I'd say. Buildings that used to sell for $50 a square foot now selling for $100 a square foot. Why is that? Well, the big uh, driving force for all of this is the low interest rates. And uh, low interest rates by the banks drive low cap rates for the investors. Um, there are uh, uh, a lot of high bay distribution facilities being built today on spec. Um, we were working with a group four or five months ago looking to lease 200,000 square feet of high bay industrial space. Uh, we did a survey. This company wanted to be south of Boston or west of Boston. And uh, we did a survey and I was shocked when I found out how many options there were for this company. There were close to 20 options for a 200,000 square foot tenant half of which were existing buildings and the other half were speculative buildings. Um, there are a lot of people coming out of the ground today with speculative 300,000 square foot distribution facilities. Um, the big news in the market was, is and was Amazon in terms of industrial space. Reportedly, but not verifiable yet, about five or six weeks ago, Amazon signed letters of intent on 2 million square feet of suburban industrial space ranging from Franklin and Bellingham down through Canton and across the South Shore, Taunton, Norton, all on 495. The industrial product is no longer on Route 128, it's all on 495. 
So that's a huge chunk of space. I'm not sure that that's good news because that two million square feet of space, that's business that's being taken away from other smaller companies that are doing warehousing and distribution. So uh, the advent of the smartphone and people being able to get whatever they want the next day delivered to their home, I think that's going to create further changes in the industrial market. I think there's going to be less demand for 300,000 square foot distribution facilities and more demand for buildings closer to 100,000 to 50,000 square feet because of what they call the last mile delivery cycle. Um, the demand is strong. Industrial land is very difficult to find. Um, the land that's left is marginal land. It's either got ledge or wetlands or environmental issues. The cost to build a new facility is easily over $100 a square foot. So that's going to drive the rents to a higher level. But uh, at some point, the music will stop. There'll be a correction in the market. And the last guys in are going to be the first guys out because they're going to be leveraged. They're going to be expecting $7, $8 square foot rent for warehouse space. They're going to have an interest rate on the loan of 3%. And uh, the bank's going to come calling. We're going to call those notes. So we will see another cycle. I don't want to be gloom and doom, but I'm going to be prepared. <clears throat> well, you just transitioned perfectly to challenges. And I want to come back to Clark. What do you see as kind of the macro challenges to regional economic growth? What, what are the big challenges from your perspective? And then we'll go right down the panel, big or specific challenges that you've seen. Go ahead. Sure, I would say uh, two. One is transportation and realizing, making the transportation network more reliable, but also making it multi-directional. I think that has, as I mentioned earlier, has huge potential for this region. The other is around um, zoning and land use. I think uh, there's been some very modest reform proposed by the governor to reduce the margin from a two-thirds to a majority, simple majority vote for, um, for zoning changes that promote growth and smart growth. Uh, if we don't do something to fix the, the sort of paralysis around local decision making and local zoning decisions, I think, I think we're going to be in real trouble. So I'd say transportation and zoning are the two big ones for me. Those are easy to fix. Yep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I would segue off of that. I think that public transportation remains a, a key driver in an office tenant's decision making. Uh, you know, we, we hear it anecdotally every day. Not every employee has a car. A tenant who might have public transit access today can't necessarily go off of that public transit opportunity because their workforce just can't adapt to it and they don't, they're not able to drive to work. So I think there's huge opportunity in that if, if you can have the public transit infrastructure set up to get employees to and from work each day. I also think that um, when I talk about amenities and creating a live work play environment, that's easier said than done, that's, you know, to some extent. I mean, what happened up at University Station was really, a, I think, a aligning of the stars where you have train, retail, residential, all right around office space. And, and I think that's proof in concept. Citizens Bank just announced that they're building a 100,000 square foot building right there on the train at University Station. So I think that's proof in how these tenants are making their decisions. But I still think it, it takes a lot of um, foresight and I think it takes some forward thinking to be able to align housing, um, quality office space with amenities, and then amenities in the area, along with public transit, which I think is the true formula for success. So bringing that all together, I think, again, it's easier for me to say, hey, do this, but putting it into practice, I think, is much much more challenging. Mark, you have anything to add there? Yeah, I, I totally agree with uh, my fellow panelists here. What, what's going to drive development here on, on South Shore is uh, the community rail extension down in Bedford. Uh, they've already identified sites, they've already purchased the land, the uh, rail beds are under construction, construction contracts have been given out. So uh, when the market turns, what's going to happen is all those people that are paying $50 a square foot for office space in Quincy are going to be looking at Brockton and Bridgewater where the rents are going to be $25 a square foot 
And a market correction helps the South Shore because right now when the economy is just strong, people and companies will pay $80 a square foot to be in the financial district. But as soon as their revenue starts to drop, they look at cutting overhead. And in my perspective right now, suburban, my definition of suburban office space is different from Tyler's. My suburban office space is based from Brockton South. His definition is Brockton North. And uh, we're, we have a lot of available office space Suburban office space is languishing on the market because people will be able to afford to go to Stoughton and Canton and Braintree. Thank you, Mark. Jason, what are your challenges? Construction costs. Construction costs. Construction costs <laughs> are absolutely our biggest challenge right now. Um, you know, in reflecting on where we are, we spent the last 50 years telling our kids in general, you need to go to college, and not telling them to go to trade schools. I mean, I would love it if my daughter or my son just told me one day they want to become an electrician or a plumber. Um, if you call our plumber and try to leave a voicemail, it's outgoing voicemail that says, if you're not a current customer, please don't leave a voicemail, I don't have time for you. Um, and it's true. And construction costs, you know, I don't know what the, what the published facts are, but we're seeing year-over-year -year increases of like 7%, 8%, and it's unbelievable. We file applications to the state for funding based on one number, and then if we get funded you know, a year or two later, our costs are 15% higher. Um, we see this on the market rate side, on the affordable side, we just don't have enough construction workers, we don't have enough skilled laborers um, because of this. I think a lot of this to do with the focus of you have to have a desk job. <laughs> um, it was never an op option for me, I was always going to college, you know, and it's really unfortunate. Um, a lot of our contractors I know have called their subcontractors or folks who have retired and begged them to come out of retirement. Um, and these are really, you know, highly respectable um, trades. You know, doing drywall is not an easy thing to do. And it's amazing when you see these guys go into a building and throw up the drywall and skim the plaster. I don't know if anybody's ever tried it. It's really difficult and um, it's really technical. And I think. You know, and so we start recognizing that we have an issue. And I think we all have to address it. I think the construction companies have to address it. I think as developers, we have to address it and encourage folks to go into these trades. Um, we're just gonna see increasing costs and increasing costs. I don't know when it's gonna end, and I don't know how we're gonna keep affording it, so. We, uh, we have about five minutes. We're gonna just see if anyone in the audience has a question or two, but Jason, I forgot to ask you a question. I know it's on the minds of everyone in the audience. You told us that story about the safe. What was in the safe? There was nothing in the safe. Darn it. <laughs> you must have been over Al Capone. <laughs> All right, someone out there had a question. Why don't yeah, we, we, have, we have a few out here, Fred. Good, good, uh, go ahead. You know, one of the questions I have is because, uh, you know, it, this comes up all the time, is the uh, no one going into the trades. And I think Steve Kelly from Timberline, he also always talks about that. Fred. You're the president of Bridgewater State University. Uh, what's your feeling on that whole situation, on the trades? Well, I, you know, the, um, the Vogue Tech schools are very, very popular. Um, there's waiting lists to get into Vogue Tech schools, so I'm not sure that it's a demand problem or a supply problem. I, I think we just need to produce um, more students in, the, in those trades and make sure that they have easy access to apprenticeships and such. But, you know, our students uh, at Bridgewater State have different trades that they want to go into and, you know, we have a role for them also, whether they want to be a teacher or a social worker or an accountant and that type of thing. But, um, you know, we need to support the Vogue Tech schools. We need to make sure we increase the supply. We're paying $500 a square foot for a building we're about to put up at Bridgewater. It's crazy. And I, I do think a market correction would probably help everybody on this panel in different ways. I hope that helps, Rick. Question? Dave Carlin with Integrated Security Group. Uh, before I ask my question, I, uh, Mark, you mentioned the cycle and the best in 30 years. In the early 90s, after a boom in the 80s, I remember seeing a prayer on a real estate agent's wall. It said, uh, please God, let there be another real estate boom, dot, dot, dot. And this time I promise not to blow it all. 
So obviously the question is where we are in that cycle. Um, this morning, if you're driving here and listening to WEI, uh, the governor was on uh, with some really great comments that fit in here. Um, one of the things he said, you guys mentioned Amazon. That I don't think this Amazon or the internet thing is going to catch on, but as they have more property, um, uh, they decided not to choose Boston. Part of me thinks that was a good choice, but the reason why they chose not to choose Boston was troubling to the governor, and it should be to us, that Boston was one of the most expensive cost of living places uh, in, in the country. And it's coming from Seattle, where actually Seattle is not, not a bargain either. And the housing that I see that we need is not the affordable housing, quote unquote, that you have to qualify for with the low income. It's, it's the people stuck in the middle. They can't afford the, the million dollar, you know, uh, thousand square foot place um, in, in the seaport. Um, and so the question, you mentioned construction costs, I think it's a huge issue because no one's gonna invest in the property unless they can get a return in a reasonable amount of time. And less and less people are speculating. Um, so I guess I'm looking to the experts is what's the answer to get a, a, a home that some of those electricians, some of those plumbers can actually afford um, and, and get to where they need to work. Clark, do you want to take that? My simple answer is the demand is there and is willingness to build that kind of housing and the zoning for the most part does not allow it. If you look at single family zoning across the Commonwealth, the average lot size for a new single family home is, is more than an acre. Um, the idea is sort of a lot of the modest neighborhoods that people grew up in, they were wonderful neighborhoods to raise kids in. You know, my, my neighborhood is a great example. None of, you know, none, none of those houses can be built today in the current zoning. Most, you know, there are a whole bunch of what we call illegal neighborhoods that are great neighborhoods that are really hard, hard to buy into that you couldn't build today because the zoning has become so much more restrictive. And also apartments. Um, uh, Multifamily housing is not allowed as a right in most cities and towns in, in eastern Massachusetts. Um, there's a history of, uh, you know, post-war of uh, allowing garden apartments, sort of modest, you know, modest housing that people can, can live in when they work, raise a family, and again, the zoning doesn't allow that. So I think Without getting into subsidies, which is which is a whole you know, a whole other you know challenge, and people at the lower end of the income scale, we have we have willing buyers and renters, and we have willing builders, and we have a system that doesn't allow that connection to be made. Just following up, is 40B and 40R are they run their course? Are they not a solution? Um, 40R, the smart growth zoning law, is a great concept. It's only resulted in about 3,000 units in 12 or 13 years. That is not moving the needle at all. In Chapter 40B, which is controversial and allows you know mixed income projects to override local zoning, is is uh, has very little steam left. There's there's uh, within the Metro Boston region, I think uh, only 20,000 more units could be built under under 40B, and that's that really pales in comparison to the need. So they've made a little bit of a difference, but we need some some other game changers here. I know Jason wanted to ask. Something. Yeah, no, I was just going to say. So I live in Newton, and um, people are tearing down these single family ranches and building up, building mansions, right? And it, it absolutely goes back to zoning. Imagine if, and you could do that as a right. Imagine if you could take down the ranch and put three smaller homes on that lot. Um, the developer would make more money, most likely, and you'd be creating three units of sort of organic, affordable housing. You know, instead of building a two and a half to three million dollar mega mansion, and if you could have four units, right? That would you'd be in this for Newton seven or eight hundred thousand for a new single family house, which is like I know it sounds crazy, but it would be a bargain, right? Because <laughs> everybody's building these McMansions at three million dollars, so it all does go back to zoning. Um, it's really construction cost and zoning, zoning, zoning. You know. Okay, we're going to take one more question. Hi, Dan Trout, Northeast and Savings Bank. Just a question for the panel: If you could comment on WeWork and that, you know, the, in the marketplace. Sure. Yeah, we've been getting this question a lot uh, from our clients recently throughout uh, Boston and the suburbs, and we've studied it pretty extensively. So just a couple of quick facts on WeWork. So they have 1.6 million square feet in downtown Boston right now. Uh, they have two other deals that were in progress when everything kind of stopped for them that they've since walked away from. Um, a couple things to remember when you think about WeWork. First of all, Boston right now is below 7% vacant. If they were to give back all of their space, all 1.6 million square feet, 
the market would still be single digit vacancy, which is extremely healthy. Um, second of all, and when we keep reminding people of this, you have end users in all of this WeWork space. So the majority of large WeWork deals that have happened in Boston are enterprise deals per se, which means they have a tenant with them when they go and lease that space. So, for example, one Lincoln Street where State Street sign has been for years, and State Street's now building a tower over at One Conver Street. They went and leased 250,000 square feet with Puma and Amazon in tow. Uh, basically, while Amazon gets their building built in the seaport and Puma builds their building in Assembly Row, they'll occupy that space for three to five years was their plan as swing space. And so I think what will ultimately happen, and, I, and personally, I don't, think, I don't think they're going anywhere in Boston because, again, they have users in this space. They're all single-purpose entities. Um, I don't think they're going anywhere in the short term. And even if they were to, I, they would, the landlord would likely take some of those tenants direct on a direct basis, um, not resulting in a huge increase in vacancy. So we've looked at Armageddon. If they totally left the market, you're still single-digit vacancy. Ultimately, demand is so strong from life sciences, tech, financial services. It's so diverse, uh, the, the hospitals and medical institutions. It's so diverse in Boston and the suburbs right now that I don't think any one tenant will be the reason that we have a market correction per se. I think it would have to be something more macro economic in nature. I think we're at the end of uh, this panel. And we uh, are at the end, unfortunately, because it was a great conversation. I want to thank you, Mark, for uh, reading the journal since you were two years old. Uh, <laughs> Did you get a discount <laughs> for that? Yeah. He gets a discount. Oh, okay. That's why I'm still reading it. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the panel. They did a fantastic job. Uh, we're going to assemble the next panel. Uh, so if anyone has to take a bathroom break or grab another cup of coffee, if you want to hurry back here, take a seat, and we'll, the next panel is going to begin in a couple of minutes. Before we go on to the next panel, I also like to thank the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. Our uh, corporate sponsors, Rockland Trust Bank, uh, Platinum Partners, LLC, Danger's Permitting Consulting. If you haven't given them your business card, please do, because we're going to give away a $50 gift card to the program at the Joint Legal. We're going to have plenty of time to network right after this. I'd also like to mention that the Metro South Chamber of Commerce and the Brockton Rotary Club are going to serve a lunch after the, this panel ends. So if you haven't had enough to eat for breakfast, get ready to have a nice lunch as well. If I could please have everyone take a seat. Okay, folks, we're going to get started. Thank you very much for your patience. Why don't we, uh, if you could take your seats, we'll get going. Our second panel, our second all-star panel is ready to go. We have with us Jim Keith from Trinity Development and Management. We have Jerry Nado from Quartland Trust, Kim Sluter from New England Construction, Edmund Tucker from Pronto King. And if I could, I'm just going to go right down the panel, and if our panelists can just introduce themselves, maybe just a word or two about uh, not only what you do, but what you're focused on as well. We'll start with Jerry. Good morning. Is this working? Yep. Good. Um, so my name is Jerry Nadel. I'm the president of Rockland Trust Company. And you know, I guess what's most important to us is that despite you know, our growth, that we continue to be important partners in all the communities we're in, investing in the communities, both with our resources and our time. So that's it. Hi, I'm Kim Sluter with New England Construction. We are a second generation construction firm. Uh, we are busier than we've ever been. Uh, we've been in business about 35 years and we've been a generalist over the years, typically serving um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. We do cover most of the Northeast region. 
Um, we have, we'll do about 62 million this year. We already have 50 million under contract for next year. Um, so we're poised for some significant growth. And we can talk about that a little bit later when we get into labor and building material costs. Um, we do a lot of retail, we do auto, we do a ton of multi-unit. Um, and I guess that would be who we are. Thank you, Jim. Um, my name is Jim Keith, and I am the principal at Trinity Financial in Boston. We're a Boston-based real estate development company with offices in Boston and in New York. Oh, we've developed uh, almost uh, 8,000 units of housing uh, over the 32 years we've been in business. And we um, are going on $3 billion in uh, total development costs. Uh, we started out very humbly. Uh, I have a lot of sentimental attachment to, uh, to Brockton because I grew up in Holbrook. And Brockton was our city. And we came over here as kids to get school clothes. Uh, we came over here to go to the Brockton Fair. Um, came over here to... Um, I watched the submarine races in Fenway Park at uh, the DW Field Park. Yeah, I, to I remember that McDonald's had like, you know, only like 100,000 hamburgers sold. So I guess I'm dating myself. For 20 cents. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I was fortunate enough, or we were fortunate enough to uh, get involved with a, with a project called uh, Enterprise, what we now call the Enterprise Center, which um, I may uh, take a moment or two to uh, share a little bit more about that experience later. Good morning. I'm Edmund Tucker. I'm the CEO for Frontal King LLC. I want to thank the Chamber for inviting us here today. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Frontal King. It was a dream of our owner who started out in the back of his car just selling bits and pieces of tobacco. Today the company is uh, 2018. We're a $10 billion company and we employ worldwide about uh, 200 people. Thank you, Evan. Thank you, panel. We uh, this this particular panel really is focused on financing development. There'll be a little bit of overlap with the first panel as well. But different experiences up on this particular panel. We want to be sure we share those experiences. But we have a bank president here, and I want to ask you, Jerry, what are you seeing in terms of financing for real estate development uh, from your perspective? What trends are are uh, are underway? I guess there's, there's probably a few that are maybe interesting. Perhaps you will find them as well. Uh, first, no surprise, interest rates are very low. Interest rates have really collapsed since the end of 2018. When we finished 2018, the 10-year treasury yielded just over 3%. It's now 1.5%. So it's made a substantial difference. You know, you've seen commercial real estate loans now in the threes. What's interesting, and I had a conversation at a dinner Tuesday night with a developer. We're talking about it. The real estate tax rate actually now is almost a third as much as the interest rate. Because most real estate taxes in the communities we're in are it's 1% or more. And interest rates are the three. I've never seen it that close in my entire career that the burden of real estate taxes can be that close to what interest is. Now, unfortunately, what's happened with those low interest rates were, as the earlier panels talked about, cap rates. So what's happened is these very, very low cap rates on generally investor properties. So this is something that's under a long-term lease, typically oftentimes with a credit-worthy tenant. But these properties are selling where the income compared to the purchase price is putting 4 and 5% returns on them. So because people are willing to pay those rich of a price. The problem is, and it, it best explained it, I can see it, is that someone's buying a property for $100, they put down $40, and they can still barely make the payment. Because by the time they make a principal and interest payment, even though interest rates are low, the price they're paying is even lower. So the cost is high, that, interest, that cap rate being low. So there's a real disconnect. So that interest rate conundrum led to this conundrum of you know, having people have to put more and more equity into something to make it work has changed the dynamics, at least in my history, doing banking, is in Massachusetts where increasingly a lot of investor transactions are being done with private equity, pension funds, family offices, putting in the equity. Because the developer themselves realizes they can't put in 40 or 50% and not get a return on it, because that's ultimately what ends up happening. There's really no near-term return on their money. So it's really changing the business 
And it's interesting, we do some business in Rhode Island, and Rhode Island is still a family-owned investing business, so when you look at an investment transaction in Rhode Island, you almost inevitably see it's all family cash in the deal, but not in Massachusetts. Anything of size now is all being done with investor equity, who hopefully has a much longer term time frame and patience. So, so that as Mark talked about those downturns, as they come, hopefully they'll stick with it. But it is a big change. Then perhaps the third one, and it did echo something that Jason talked about, is that environmental. So it's interesting that we finance, in the course of the year, we'll finance maybe a thousand pieces of commercial real estate. We have two full-time colleagues that focus on looking at environmental reports. That's their sole job, is to review environmental reports. So last year they reviewed, I think, 900 environmental reports. But increasingly, what's happened is the properties that our clients are buying, particularly those, whether for housing redevelopment or business plan, is buying a piece of property that you're either going to tear down and build new or expand, there's environmental issues. Because it, I think Mark Donahue said a lot of the better properties have been picked over. So what remains at these sites, there's metals, arsenic, lead. So we're spending a lot more time working with these clients to understand, you know, can we and they live with those environmental conditions? As Jason said, some you can live with, metals tend to stay in the ground, but others do not. And, and perhaps one takeaway just to share with you, if you yourself are looking at property today, please make sure you do the environmental due diligence, because sometimes you'd be a shock what it can cost to clean up some innocuous, what you think is innocuous spill can become very expensive. So those are probably the three things I thought maybe made some sense. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Jerry. Kim, what uh, trends are you seeing? You teased a little bit uh, about costs that you're facing, and how are you? What, what are those trends, and how are you overcoming them? I would take probably a three-pronged approach to answering that question with trends in, in costs alone. Um, if we want to talk about the subcontractors and the trades first, we can talk about the shortage that was mentioned earlier, that there's a shortage in that labor force themselves. They are also poaching from each other. You even have the unions coming in and um, ask, and poaching non-union personnel for um, and just providing more money. Um, you have, I was talking, I was on site the other day and we had um, a subcontractor who told us he's in the sprinkler business. He lost eight people just last month to another non-union um, competitor. Um, so they're poaching from each other and there's a shortage to begin with. Um, so that's challenging and they're extremely busy. As I told you right now we have 50 million under contract for next year which is the largest backlog we've ever had. Um, and so if we're busy, the subs are extremely busy. So they're selective too. Um, so they're poaching from each other. There's a shortage in who they have up and coming, right? Because not as many people are going into those trades. And then um, you also have on top of that you have um, you have the costs that are associated with the building materials. So you have things like dimensional wood, which has been extremely volatile, increased over 50% just in the last three years. It's not as high as it was in Q1 of last year, but a lot of that has to do with government and politics and the tariffs that have been imposed. I mean, you could say the same for steel. It hasn't been as significant of an increase, but it's definitely there. Um, so then you have subcontractors that their building materials are more expensive, their cost to keep and retain employees is more expensive, so where does that get passed on, right? And then the same could be safe, said for the GCs. I mean, we have 46 employees, and we are constantly talking about our talent acquisition and maintaining the team we have, because we're nothing if we, if we don't have an, a project execution team that can execute the work on time and on budget. Um, so that's, that's also a shortage that we feel, and we even look as an employer, we have to get creative. I mean, things that might never have been on the table are on the table now. We're looking at even, you know, having a zero contribution medical plan, having unlimited PTO, and we're going to pilot a program like that. We're doing things to retain our own employee talent as well. Um, I would say, I mean, our, our industry, we're also trying to differentiate ourselves. We're 35% women at our company, where it's typically in an industry that's 10% women. So um, you just have to get creative, but it's expensive. I would say if you're an owner listening to me, you're saying, so what am I going to do about that? Well, get your GC on board early. Get them on board early so that resources are lined up, and our job is to get you the true cost of the work. So the sooner you get, you get us on board, and the sooner we can be... Um, transparent and clear with each other about what the budget is, the sooner we can get doing our job. And if the subs 
know that it's our job, right? They're going to, they also will give you the best and final on bid day at the beginning. So what, I, what we're seeing a lot is um, we're doing a lot of CM at risk projects where you go to a GMP and offer some type of shared savings in it. So you get us on board early. We don't make money in pre-con. I'm sure my competitors might say the same as well. That you know we're just on board to help you in the change management management process by helping you drive towards a designated budget that's going to make the numbers work and make your project happen. And what we'll do is we can weigh in on constructability. We can weigh in in some of those cost estimates that you can actually take to the bank, and they're valid validated by actual subs and GCs that are going to be involved. We still competitively bid the project, so you're still getting our best number, but you've afforded more time for us to come up with that number. And then once we've all established a, a budget there that is a take it to the bank number, then we go ahead and execute. We can award packages early if you're on board early. Um, and then we can also, we're all driving, if there's a shared savings, you have an entire project team all collaborating on you know, driving that number down, whether it's a 60-40 or a 75-25 type arrangement. Um, so we're seeing that a lot more. I mean, we're doing that just over at Westgate Mall. We just have been part of that redevelopment here in Brockton with the Burlington stores and now a Dex is coming. Um, and that's been a great arrangement with New England Development. Kim, do you have any other projects down here other than Westgate? We've done a ton. Okay. And um, right now, Quincy, we were just awarded last week um, a project where um, Beth Israel is coming in. So we're doing some work for them. We're doing, we do Wareham Plymouth. We did all of Wareham Marketplace. Um, there's a lot happening here. We see a fair amount of commercial as well, like the industrial one that was spoken earlier. And then what we're really chasing, and that was with the Beth Israel, is the, um, is is like the corporate office space is coming. And then we're seeing in the retail world a lot of landlord work where you have like large movie theaters and you're putting up pad buildings in those parking lots that you're trying to maximize your your footprint on the existing shopping center sites that you have. And we're seeing a lot of like. Ground up 9,000 square feet, you throw three tenants in there, a Starbucks, an Orange Theory, and, a, and you know, maybe some type of urgent care or something like that, small. Um, we're seeing a ton of that. Starbucks is going like gangbusters. They're coming everywhere right now. Chick-fil-A, another one of ours. Good. Um, Jim, you, we'll give you a chance to talk about your project um, as well. And um, if you also could, just to pick up on the theme of trends overall, but also financing trends. You know, What are you seeing in terms of uh, access to capital and the technical restrictions that Jerry talked about a little bit earlier. But, but tell us about your project first. Well, uh, <clears throat> let me uh, address uh, that uh, access to capital. <clears throat> These are the best of times. They, they really are. Uh, there's money flying all over the place. Um, maybe not from Jerry's bank, but kind of <laughs> 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 um, and, and, and Jerry will, this has also been around long enough to know that when the market gets this frothy, um, something bad is probably going to happen. I don't know where it's going to come from. Um, uh, but I, I, I've just been through four of these during my career. And, uh, you know, it's a very frothy time. And people are forgetting um, what happens when the tide goes out, especially if you're swimming naked, as the expression goes. Uh, this is a great time to be a borrower because interest rates are so low. We have looked at our portfolio, and to the extent that we could recapitalize some of our properties, we, we took advantage of that. Great time to be involved. Um, we have a very flat yield curve. Um, so we're actually short-term rates now, but pretty much for the long-term rates. Uh -huh. um, as uh, Jerry pointed out, the cap rates are, are low. Uh, there aren't a lot of deals that, uh, that don't work when you apply a 4 or 5% cap rate. Um, so, Hence, a lot of deals are happening based upon that. And um, it's very unique, it's certainly unique. And in my experience, and there wasn't too long ago when people didn't even know what cap rates were because lots was on the market and nobody was buying it, nobody had the cash to buy it. So there wasn't even a cap rate to even measure that. And we went through some very scary times um, and opportunities, um, times of opportunity for people who did have cash. Um, so I, I came out of the banking world. I, I worked at the World First National Bank in Boston. In fact, it was my pleasure, Jerry, to work with uh, several people in your bank, really good people, John McGregor and, uh, and uh, a, a beloved guy, Joe Tansy, who some of you may know, who just retired last Monday. Um, so I came out of a banking background. And 
you know, banks, they like to get their money back. And so uh, there isn't any speculation associated with that. Uh, they really need to get it back. And that was great discipline for me becoming a developer because I, I, I we can impose a discipline on the projects that we were looking at and trying to implement. Um, a discipline that um, would then align itself to a favorable reaction from a, a money institution. And we've been fortunate enough to have our relationships with a number of different banks. And, and I think part of that reason is institutionally, we really understand what bankers need to have. So I go back to these are the best of times. Um, I would just um, caution some of the other people in the room that uh, something's going to happen. Uh, nobody could have predicted uh, subprime mortgages being the unwinding of the economy at that time. Uh, nobody could have predicted the, the dot-com bust. Um, I, I know WeWork was mentioned before. I kind of feel like WeWork may be one of those things that you might have read that they just tried to go public, and um, it was a disaster for them. And, uh, and it's now got people scratching their head wondering just how miraculous WeWork is. Um, we do a lot of work in gateway cities. Uh, we're, we've always been intrigued by the opportunity there, uh, not just Brockton, but, but in Laurel. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the Hamilton Canal District. Uh, in in uh, Worcester, we're uh, halfway through the adaptive reuse of the Worcester County Courthouse, this huge monumental building right downtown. We're doing an adaptive reuse of that. Um, and then uh, you know, we did the Enterprise Project in Boston in Brockton, and a couple of connections there. I used to live in Brockton. It was an afternoon uh, job I had after work, and it was 42 cents a week, and it was six days a week, and I collected on Fridays. Um, and some people came into my office one day, and you know, this was back in the last crash, 2005, 2006, and they kind of put all these properties out, and I looked at it, it was downtown Brockton, and it involved the enterprise. Uh, building and they're pretty at the time. And it was a mess. I mean, it wasn't as if they were representing a seller because actually there were five, turned out five different sellers. But um, maybe it was sentimentality because I used to deliver it. Um, my mother worked in Brockton a number of years. Um, I said, I want to do this project. And uh, it took us a while to put it together. Um, it was a big project. Uh, we're about two thirds of the way through. We still have the, the last phase to do, but. Um, uh, it has been one of the more interesting and rewarding uh, projects that we've ever done because, uh, you know, many of you may remember what it looked like uh, before, but it, it really is something that is quite remarkable in its transformation. And we're quite proud of that, and we're especially grateful to the uh, John Marion's of the world and, uh, and the Mary, are you still there? <coughs> you know, just Mary's people. always here. <laughs> hey, she is. Um, Chris Cooney, just people that encouraged us, people that uh, kept us going um, through uh, you know uncertain uh, uncertain uh, uh, waters, but uh, we hung with it, they hung with it, and um, I think we've started something terrific, which we hope will establish uh, a high bar for other developments in downtown Brockton, because it's going to take time, but if you take it on piece by piece by piece, you will have a dynamic, fantastic downtown uh, that people will want to go to. They want to live there, they want to shop there, they want to play there. And that's not going to happen tomorrow, but it's going to, uh, it's going to happen. Jim, before we go to Edmund, I just want to ask you, because you're in other gateway cities, um, are you seeing anything different in the Brockton area, Metro Brockton, that is uh, maybe an exceptional opportunity vis-a-vis -vis Lawrence or Lowell or Worcester. They hate when you say Western Mass, by the way. Worcester. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Central Mass. But what, what, what are you saying that might be different about this area? You know what's remarkable about it is how much they are the same. Yeah. It is remarkable mm -hmm. in that uh, same form of government, usually a, a um, one or a better term, a weak mayor, strong city council. Uh, there's usually a prominent newspaper that uh, chronicles uh, the day to day events. Um, there is um, fledgling um, chambers uh, like this one in Lowell. They have the Lowell plan, which has been up and running for 20 years. Um, but a strong business community that uh, supports uh, good, solid, uh, thoughtful development. 
Um, so it remarkably the same, and they're, they're all struggling uh, with the same kind of challenges. Uh, you're kind of like um, an outlying uh, province from, from Boston. They all, the most part, with the exception of New Bedford and Fall River, but that's going to happen soon. They all are served by commuter rail. Uh, but it's amazing how the challenges are the same. Yeah. I had one thing to that. Right. Operating in both of those markets, I would say that some of what makes our suburban, when it comes south or western work, a little less expensive is you do get subcontractors from Rhode Island. You can draw from a sub base that is willing to go there versus when we're doing our downtown Boston work. Um, we're paying, you're going to pay more because those subcontractors are traditionally more. So the, so the being able to draw from a wider sub base um, for some of these gateway cities, both in Worcester and Brockton, is definitely an advantage. Thank you, Kim. Edmund, tell us about your your company. Tell us about your experiences, and um, you know, in particular with a focus on Brockton, Metro Brockton. You know, what have you found in your experience? Well, thank you. For when we chose uh, Brockton, we, we looked at Stoughton as well, and there's no slap to anybody. We just looked at it, and the big thing about Brockton was we felt the community embracing us and encouraging us. I mean, when we worked with Mutual Bank, with Dan, and uh, he encouraged us to uh, work with our project there, and uh, all the things that we saw with Brockton were tremendous in the welcoming that we had with Brockton. The facility that we acquired was one that we really needed because we need certain amounts of spaces to do our distribution. And the facility was exactly what we needed. And we went about uh, repairing it. And to the good lady who's in the construction business, we can agree prices are way up. Thank you, Ron. Jerry, back to you. Um, you hear a lot of conversation about the 24 quarter, through 24 quarter. And when I was a younger man, um, there was no traffic on 24. Now you you sit in a parking lot all the way back to Lakeville and Taunton. <coughs> so development along 24, can you give us a sense of what that development is looking like from your perspective, opportunities, challenges? Yes, you know, 24 is, uh, I think, Tyler and Mark probably um, can explain it better than I, but Route 24 is really a series of submarkets because it really doesn't fall neatly into a typical geography that's measured by some of the real estate firms like CoStar or Reese. It's a series of submarkets as you run down. But if you think about 24 running from probably where uh, Randolph down to Fall River and Bedford, uh, at the most southern end, um, what's interesting is that there's still been some industrial land available, both in the Fall River and Bethy industrial parks. Um, the largest being the Fall River was Amazon with a million square feet. Um, New Bedford has historically Titleist, Foot Joy, if you're familiar with golf, there have been some of the anchor companies there. Um, very recently, um, there was a company uh, by the name of Plumma Supply. Uh, they just built a 175,000 square foot distribution center in the New Bedford industrial park. They are a company that essentially covers much of Eastern Mass. But, so that end of the city, I think there's still a few lots left in each of those parks. But as you then come up 24, um, what's going to challenge a little bit is there's very little new construction for someone that wants to be a landlord. It's very hard to achieve enough rent on 24 to build a new building at the cost that your <laughs> company charges and others today to, make, to, to do with the market rates. The one exception to that uh, is really exemplified by uh, Pat Carney and the Clemmel companies has been very successful in Bridgewater, right off of 104, uh, both doing uh, the new apartment buildings. The first one that Clark Ziegler referred to has been very successful, now starting the second, Viva, I think it's called, and then the hotel that they built. So that, those are some exceptions that you can do some new construction on 24. I think there's some exceptions of retail uh, on a spot basis, because really Westgate Mall has really been changing the original building, not really building new yeah, malls. It's a redevelopment of it. And, and as Tyler talked about, at the most northern end, what went on with the old Reebok building that Conroy Athens built back, I think it was in the 80s, um, that you know, it's had vacant for some time. So that building works, but it works because you bought an existing building for a reasonable price and you could retrofit it. But in between, there's some interesting opportunities because, you know, very recently the Taunton Mall just sold, and it's just, which those of you who are near 140, 
And I'm told that it was less than $10 a foot that it sold for at an auction. I think it's $7.8 million. And it's, I think there's a million square feet or close to it there. Um, and probably 100 acres of paving. Something's probably going to happen if it's not a mall. And that's probably good for us. I mean, that's probably one of the larger development sites. Now, the people that bought it, I don't think have made any announcements. I'm not sure they had a plan. They just bought it and thinking it was a good buy. And another one that the chamber did a great study on just a few years ago was the Brockton Fairgrounds. The Brockton Fairgrounds is nearly 50 acres right off of Route 123 in Brockton. It's an opportunity zone. It's one of the largest opportunity zones in the state. I'm not sure if it's number one, but it's very close to it. So those two are examples of large sites that I think represent redevelopment opportunities. I'm not sure for what. I, you know, as Mark said, I don't think we can achieve enough office rents to justify new construction. And I think the industrial at $100 a foot is a little bit of a stretch. So there's a lot going on in 24, but it's, it's a mix of what works and, and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you, Jerry. I'm just curious about retail. Kim, you have a lot of experience with retail, too. Are there um, cautions um, when you're working in retail? Or is there a financing issue when you're working in constructing retail? With the advent of online, and you know, you do worry about the future of retail. And uh, I'm not sure it's a, a good thing to have it completely centralized and delivered to your house by drone or otherwise. But what's your sense of the future of retail and access to capital? We get that question a lot. Um, probably about 60 to 65 percent of our portfolio is retail, and I'm very active in ICSC, which is the International Council of Shopping Centers. Was the chair of the. Uh, largest real estate conference in Boston this summer. And every year it's the same theme. Is retail dead? The answer is it's not dead. Um, the answer is that it's changing and you have to be on the cusp of that changing. And um, that's what we are finding a lot with our landlord cu customers, right? Our landlord clients are constantly looking at how to maximize their footprint, whether it is adding that pad building in the cinema um, parking lot or if it's um, demalling a mall like they did at we did at Rhode Island Mall or other areas. Um, when you look at they look at either changing to what the consumer is, um, and the reality is when you talk to the retailers themselves, most of them are just shrinking their footprint. Um, we consider we consider banking part of retail as well, and we're seeing a lot of um, banks that are coming up. I mean, we're just doing three citizens right now, so branches are still are still happening. Um, we also see you know, interesting concepts coming out of like Capital One and we've done a couple of their cafes where you can go in for coffee and have Pete's coffee but do your banking at the same time. Um, it's very interesting. Um, I think they're trying to get creative. I don't know exactly what will stick, but I do know that the landlords are going to constantly have to reposition and repurpose and retenant their space. Um, so it's about trying to create, you hear a lot about lifestyle centers and being involved in that. Um, where you have the housing and it's the work, play, live, and you have all of your um, all of your amenities right there. We're seeing a lot in the fitness world. Um, I'm not certain when that's gonna boom. It's gonna it's gonna stop. I mean, we built all those LA fitnesses. You've got you know you've got fit factories coming. You've got all these edges that are coming into this market, um, and then you have the small boutique uh, little like you know your orange theories, etc. So we don't think retail is going anywhere. We think you do as a landowner as a um, as a um, for many of our clients, you just have to be creative and ahead of the curve. Access to capital in that space? Are you seeing any uh, changes? We're not. Uh, we're not. We're seeing tight budgets and tight delivery dates, um, and we certainly have LDs in most of our contracts in that in that regard. Um, because the, you, you know the, the, they're skinny margins, and they're trying to you know you have a, a tenant that's looking. You're doing these turnkey deals, and you have tenants that are looking to take that space, and um, owners that are, want to collect rent immediately. So the delivery dates are are tight for sure. Thank you, Kim. Jim, you, uh, in your project in Brockton, you've broken into phases. What have you learned from phase one going into phase two? Um, is it all systems go? Are there any uh, issues that you didn't anticipate uh, earlier on that you're pivoting to address? Um, well, now that the garage is just about complete, and congratulations to the city for, for uh, putting that together, uh, that's going to be a great asset to serve just not, not just uh, the enterprise uh, tenants, but also um, W.P. Mason uh, and other local employers. Um, <clears throat> parking is always a big deal. And the fact that you have a garage that size is going to uh, support, I think, continued growth. And hopefully some of that will be retail. 
Um, you know, our, our big thing is downtowns, and this kind of resonates with, I'm going to try to resonate with some of the other comments made in the earlier panel, which was terrific, by the way. Um, I, I think the challenge for Brockton and Brockton's downtown is to try to uh, attract younger, creative uh, people who come with their ideas, come with their energy, come with their vitality. Uh, these are the people that will, will open up the, the interesting shop or they'll go to that new wine store that just opened up or, or a restaurant that just opened up. Um, and you can't get enough of these. You, you cannot get enough of these because they bring their ideas, most of all their energy, and they bring it right onto the street. And they attract people like themselves. So in the case of uh, the Enterprise Building, we actually set aside 40 of the units and went for with a, what we call an artist preference. That um, all things being equal, if you were a certified artist, you were you were given um, that you were given that unit. And <clears throat> the intent there was to try to nurture this this arts community in Brooklyn, which does exist. In fact, the uh, the museum, the, the Fuller Art Museum, over in uh, Fields Park is. A you know little known but tremendously uh, appreciated among the arts community in, in America, and I think a lot of people in Brockton. How many people have been to the Fuller Art Museum? All right, for the rest of you, get over there, all right? Because it's really it's a remarkable building, and it, it's remarkable exhibits, and it nurtures this arts community. So when you think of Brockton, you think of you know all of the heavyweights. Rocky Marciano, you know, that, that, that was good for the, the 50s, but the city needs to reimagine itself as a place that's welcoming to creative people. And I think when they come and they bring their ideas and their energy, a lot of things are going to happen. And we need to be mindful of what that is and what they want to do is they want to live downtown. They're not very car dependent. Um, they don't mind walking. Uh, they're very, very good with the Uber or Lyft. Um, and they like to go out, they like to do things. And so, um, nurturing that downtown, thinking about how block by block, piece by piece, those beautiful old buildings, and many of them are beautiful old buildings. And I, I want to give a shout out to Jason Corbett, one of the earlier speakers. That he's one of those developers that gets Brockton. And is the developer that you want to welcome and have him take on and encourage him to take on, you know, Building by building by building, because right now there's a big vacancy in, in retail in downtown Brockton. There's a big vacancy in second floor space. There's a big vacancy in office space. It's really tough to justify any project when there's so much vacancy here. So it's again, I've said it before. It's base hits. It's it's being patient. It's holding yourselves to a very high bar in terms of design and thoughtfulness, and it's encouraging uh, these young developers like Jason Corp to come. And, and, and make the most of these opportunities, and, and they will. Thank you, Jen. Speaking of businesses that get Brockton, Edmund, you um, moved from Boston to Brockton. You bought a building. You're leasing some space on the west side also. And um, I know that access to talent is important to you uh, and your HR folks. Um, can you talk, to, talk to us about that um, viewpoint, and we should do a television ad uh, just about you, actually, because you're exactly the kind of employer I think we want to attract uh, to this area, particularly to this city. But, you know, moving from Boston to Brockton, why? And what was entailed in your decision making along those lines? So, mainly we moved to Brockton because of the facility. Uh, the size, the space, everything was what we needed. But as we got into that project, which took us about eight months to complete, and getting everything tied together, we saw a different kind of green for being here. We saw people that needed work. We found a homeless situation right around our building, and we started to work with that. And we became more deeply involved with the community. So uh, that in itself made a big difference for us. Our business, I haven't told you what we do. <laughs> our business is we cure a tobacco leaf, and it's used in recreation for cigarette making. Uh, you would know our competitors to be things like Philly Blunts and Dutch Nest and those kinds of things. Um, but what's interesting about our business now, even as we grow in Brockton, is we have found that we have 19, 19 competitors who are now doing the same thing that we're doing. 
In fact, large companies like Royal Blunts, and I don't know if you've, any of you in this audience have heard about those people, Swiss or Sweet, and the rest of them are all now going into making a natural leap, just like we started to do in 2007. So it's very encouraging for us, even though we're in a trend, because we understand how things go in life, uh, and we're diversifying in lots of ways. Um, Fred mentioned we're over on West Chestnut Street, and we're looking to put a CBD facility there because we recognize we have a partner in science, and we recognize there's an opportunity in all the noise that everyone's heard about that, and how you distribute the plant and so on, uh, in that we can enter the medical field and help a lot of people with some of the formulas that we've discovered working with this new partner that's to be coming up soon about us and how we're going to continue to develop. As a company and as the CEO for this company, I see a lot of opportunity to diversify in a lot of new businesses. Um, I drive up Main Street every day and to Jim's point, it's such a beautiful downtown. Uh, you can go to a lot of places like we were recently in Toronto at Kensington Park and other places that have this kind of sense of aura about them. And I think Brockton has that ability as well in the future. And I think it can be a really great place to be. We're very encouraged to be here. Our business is growing. Uh, we're trending, as I said earlier. Uh, revenue is growing. And we're very excited to be around. And just a quick question. So your employees were traveling to Boston. Now they're traveling to Brockton. To that point, yes. Yeah. We, we have a core of employees. And we saw the opportunity again with the facility that we have because the train is right across the street. So that brings our employees to work every day, and we have a group of employees that carpool in as well. But to the Brockton market, we have a lot of people locally right around Main Street that we've started to employ. We have three to four great new employees that come from Brockton that are doing an outstanding job with us. We're very proud of them. And thank you very much. We, uh, one more question, we'll go right down the panel. I'm just. Um, Similar to the last panel, what are the challenges, what are the big challenges that you're facing and that you're worried about the most um, right around the corner, Jerry? Well, I guess you know, first, uh, perhaps some of the real estate market, just echoing what Jim said. I mean, it's, it's the, you know, the conditions are absolutely perfect, and usually conditions are absolutely perfect, whether it's skiing or an economy, they don't last forever. It gets trampled. So, obviously, that's a concern. You know, where is the return coming? Where will it manifest itself? It always does a little bit different. Um, you know, I've been through, unfortunately, a number of downturns, and each cause was different. Going back, you know, the first one I remember was you know, the Tax Reform Act of 1986. And, you know, the real estate market up to that point was booming because of limited partnerships. There was essentially a significant amount of tax losses being taken by people because we had high marginal tax rates. So, a lot of people were buying these limited partnerships. Ultimately, Ronald Reagan became president, changed the law, lowered it tax, income tax rates, the limited partnerships basically ceased to work, and the real estate market fell apart. And we had, in, what in Massachusetts was the worst financial crisis, much worse in Massachusetts than it was in 08. Uh, most banks, I think Jim, you may have been working at Bank Boston then, possibly. I know I was at Rock and Trust, and I, you know, our respective stocks were down to nothing. I mean, it was a bank failing every day. So, I don't know that that's going to happen. I'm just saying that's something I certainly think about. But I think something that's, that's more uh, uh, near hand, though, is the employment situation, finding help. You know, it's just finding people that can we can afford to hire, that they can afford to work from us, that they can afford to live someplace. You know, it, it's getting increasingly difficult. You know, in, in you know, I grew up in Brockton, and I also lived in the enterprise, and I learned about credit delivering the enterprise because every week, whether you got paid or not. You had to pay in the enterprise for newspapers. That was a very important lesson at a very young age. They didn't want to hear about it. They didn't get paid. They said, you've got to pay. But putting that aside, I look at the prices in Brockton. And you know the home selling in Brockton today for over $600,000? Which is great, but it's about $600,000. How many people, not many first-time home buyers can afford them? Not even all the second-time home buyers. I bought my first house in Brockton, and I paid $50,000 for it. I'm not that old, but that puts it in perspective. My wife and I started our family with it. So it's, that is a worrisome thing. So it's, it's people, and it's the housing. And Clark was talking about it. This isn't something that is just a crisis of Brockton. It's the entire state. 
And everyone has to cooperate to solve this issue. You know, people like Jim and you know Jason with their projects are doing something for that, but it's not enough. So those are the things I'm thinking. Cost of living, talent shortage. Kim, you mentioned talent shortage in your comments already. What are the big challenges for you? Yeah, we're the same with um, when it comes to talent. I would say our two short-term issues that our senior leadership team talks about weekly is um, is talent acquisition and then it's time as well. Um, a lot of these projects, like the permit phase might be long, but you're not calling your GC until it's bid day and you're saying, oh, uh, can you turn this around in two weeks? Well, if the subs are that busy and we're that busy, the answer is no, we can't turn it around in two weeks for the true cost of the work. It will actually save you money to delay your construction start at least another week or two to get the right price um, and, and make sure their schedule is, um, reflects that. Um, so for us, it's talent and time. It's our short-term issues. Our long-term issues, we're a little bit lucky, per se, when it comes to economic forecasting because we typically, the construction industry lags about a year, 12 to, sometimes it can be as much as 15 to 18 months uh, beyond the typical, uh, the rest of the economy. So we get a little bit of a warning about an economic downturn. We follow it closely. Um, if you don't subscribe to ITR Economics out of New Hampshire, they're terrific, um, and we've, we've used them for about, for probably 30 of our 35 years, and they're a terrific firm that, with their economic forecasting, particularly in real estate and construction. Um, so we anticipate probably a, a very small dip for us um, in Q, um, probably like a year and a half from now, maybe, and then we're expecting a larger one 10 years from now. Jim, challenges. Um, others have mentioned this before, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I know when I was driving out here, it took me like 20 minutes to get here from Boston. And I just felt so bad for the people who were coming in the other direction. <laughs> Unbelievable that people could subject themselves to that every day. And that's a problem because if we're going to have any kind of growth, whether it be uh, employment growth or uh, growth in, uh, in uh, residences, uh, that highway does not have any more capacity. And it's hard to imagine uh, anybody wanting to look at a life where you're going to be spending maybe two or three hours a day going and coming to work. So lots of discussion about transportation. I think there's some really good ideas out there in terms of how to raise money to create a transportation system that services not just Boston, but Brockton, Mole, and these other cities, these satellite cities, whether they become places where people come from Boston to the Brocktons of the world or the other way around transportation system has to be brought to the 21st century. And there's going to be some tough decisions about raising sales taxes or congestion pricing, that there's a visceral reaction in this state, which incidentally is a very low tax state, but there's a visceral reaction to it. And I worry that in the end, it's just going to become the same old, nobody wants to step up. Everybody wants the benefit, but nobody wants to pay for it. I think that would be really self-defeating because I think it's going to affect uh, the economy uh, in the long term. Let me switch gears, though. Um, let's go back to downtown Brockton. Um, there are some beautiful buildings in downtown Brockton. Um, the furniture building, I believe the city took that by eminent domain. There is a building, if it was beautifully restored, if, if, if Jason brought his uh, re restoration expertise to that. I don't know Jason, because he's, he's even involved with it. But it is a very prominent building in downtown Brockton that needs to happen and needs to get done well. And then I don't know the name of the building that's next to ours, but I guess Robert Hagler used to train there. And uh, I believe it was owned by the city for a period of time. A beautiful, beautiful building which has you know, significant historic aspects to it. That needs to be restored. And you can literally walk down that street and see this building and that building. These were beautiful, beautiful buildings at, at one time and can be again. And those are the challenges I see. Those are tough projects to put together. They probably uh, require some level of subsidy. The city has to make a bold statement of taking them by eminent domain. But those are the challenges. And, and taking these on one by one by one ultimately will yield a downtown that will rival uh, the downtown at the Brockton's of, of years gone by. So those are the real immediate challenges I see. In an optimistic frame. That was great. Evan, what are your challenges? Well, other than those 19 competitors I mentioned earlier. 
lives the traditional problems. We have talent problems like everyone else. Um, it's attracting you know, upper management, middle management. It's very challenging for us given the industry we're in. However, there's some encouragement in that we see a lot of diversification in the trend as it goes. We're changing our product line around and getting ready for the new trend in our business uh, background, which is all the end. Uh, enhancement of the new marijuana products and all the recreational facilities that are coming, all of that will help our business in the future. So the challenges, we have the traditional talent and so on too. Thank you, and I know everyone out there is thinking, when are the free samples coming? <laughs> <laughs> that might be later. We, uh, yeah, thank thank you. we have free samples over there. Oh, yeah. We do. <laughs> we never travel without them. Okay. There's some right at the back table. If you're interested, we'll certainly show you how it works and tell you a little bit about it. If you're interested. And are they being spilled? No, they're not. Uh, oh, you have to <laughs> fill them up? That will be your own. I, I just want to know, are there any Oreo cookies over there? Uh, <laughs> all the Girl Scouts. All the Girl Scouts. I just want to uh, thank the panel. And we're going to go to uh, questions. Yeah, we're going to ask a couple of questions. Or take a couple of questions. Yeah. Anyone have any questions? <laughs> and, and Jerry, don't worry about that Capital One Cafe because I go to the Rock and Trust in Norwell and they always have cookies out. <laughs> and they <never> really <laughs> No questions? I think you've answered all the questions. Fantastic job. Can we have a round of applause? Can we also have a round of applause for, for Fred Clark? He did a fantastic job as moderator. And I hope you all will stick around for some lunch. The uh, Metro South Chamber and the Rock and Rotary Club is going to have a lunch in here for anyone that wants to. Continue the event for the rest of the afternoon. I also I thought I want to mention before everyone leaves. Uh, first, I want to thank our sponsors: the Rockland Trust Bank, our Latin Partners. A lunch will be served in about 15 minutes. Uh, Latin Partners, they do Burning Consulting, and, if, uh, and U.S. Bank and has many sponsors. You haven't put your business card in over at the Platinum Partners table. They are giving away a $50 gift card to the Tony Lee Golf Pro Shop and also the Metro South Chamber of Commerce. This just came in. This is big news. The Metro South Chamber of Commerce is going to give away a $100 gift card to Vegas Cafe, a five-star yellow rated restaurant and the drawing and if you put your card in over at the uh, platinum pocket so you're going to use those cards to draw that for that uh, gift card as well. I want to thank everyone for coming out today from the New England Real Estate Journal and Metro South Major I'd like to thank you all and Andre Kappa from the New England Real Estate Journal and I hope you will join us again at the uh, next event which is at the Eagle and if you contact me or email me, I'll get you a discount for joining us on Saturday.